but it's really critical to have a good source of protein, healthy fat, and great source of fiber at every meal because it's, it's, it, it, is not allowing for that stress response to happen in the body. It's, it's nourishing the body, and that's exactly what the body needs. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. That's Pharmacy with an FFA or MSUI, a place for conversations that matter. And if you've ever been stressed, which I'm sure some of you might have, this is an important conversation to listen to because it's with Dr. Elizabeth Boham, who's my colleague here at the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. She's a physician's physician. I would respect her in any medical circle, especially my family, which I have her take care of. So she is the doctor I go to for advice. And today we're going to learn about stress and something called the HPA axis, which you probably never heard of, but which is the central feature of our stress response and how it goes awry and how to fix it. So if you feel chronically stressed, if you're really not sleeping, if you have all kinds of weird symptoms that you don't know what to do with, this is the podcast for you to listen to. Welcome, Liz. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Okay, so we're going to talk about this pandemic we have, uh, but not COVID. (laughs) <laughs> it's a pandemic of chronic stress. It's coming along with COVID. It's though. coming along. It's COVID is making it a lot worse. <laughs> yes. The economic stress is making it a lot worse. Yes. The political situation, the social unrest is making it a lot worse. The economics are making it worse. So we are in a very difficult moment right now, I think, as human beings. I've never lived through anything like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I uh, and it's not just one thing, it's like a perfect storm of everything. And I hope we come out of it soon because I don't know how long we can last in this, but but we are in a state of chronic stress in our society. Uh, can you talk about what are the biggest drivers of stress for most people? And then let's get into the biology of what happens because it's fascinating because when, you, when we look at what people suffer from in terms of chronic disease, most of it's either worsened by or caused by stress. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so dealing with this is pretty important. Yeah, so stress is that is that real or perceived uh, uh, um, threat. Sorry, thank you. Is that real or perceived threat? So stress is that real or perceived threat on ourself. And it can be- It can be, be to your body or your ego. Absolutely, right? right? And it can be, it, it can be emotional stress and it can be physical stress. I think that's important to recognize. We could talk more about that because sometimes we always think it's coming from the mind, but you know, we we appreciate the fact that it's all connected and sometimes it's coming from the body and impacting the mind as well. So um, it, it's, it's either real or perceived and it impacts uh, our, our body and our health. And we know that- And when you say perceived, you mean imagine. So you could think yeah. your spouse is having an affair and they're just late at work trying to make money to take care of your family and yes. you can get the same stress response as if he actually was having an affair. Absolutely, 100%. Our mind is really powerful. And, you know, um, it, it is not always right, right? And it can create a whole bunch of, of extra stress for us many times, as can, you know, chronic news and and our, our apps and our phones and all those things that create a lot of perceived a perceived threat to our health and our well-being mm-hmm. as well that creates a lot of stress. That's absolutely true. So, you know, um, acute stress is 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 something that our body is is equipped to handle, right? So a stressful event occurs and we've got all of the things in place to be able to handle that stress. You know, we have a whole endocrine system, we have hormones, we have cortisol, we have that that fight or flight response. We can run away from that tiger or or give a presentation or um or go run a race. And all of that is is really good and important and we have it we have a body that can do that, right? And 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 we want to be able to handle stress, right? That's good for us. And the problem comes in when it becomes chronic over time and how that impacts our health long term. And we wanted to do this episode because because there's this there's this a a term being thrown around and and you know people talk about it a lot called adrenal fatigue mm. and you know people are always like well what does that mean do i have it do i not have it and 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 really how is it impacting my health it's so true and i think um you know we can't change our external circumstances often right. very easily right now right. I, I can't snap my fingers and change politics or in climate change or in war or civil unrest or even change mm-hmm. the economy. I mean, there's things I do have control over, but there's a lot of things that are real stresses. Or if I have a family member who's difficult, or if I have, 
you know, a health condition that's stressing me out. Yeah. I, I can't control that, but but we we have tremendous ability to control our thoughts and and our and our thoughts are things that yeah. influence our biology in a very direct way. There's been a lot written about this, a lot of science on this. Biology belief, uh, unleashing the power of consciousness, matter, and miracles by Bruce Lipton is an incredible book about how our immune cells, for example, uh, listen to our mind <laughs> and, and candace right? pert you know molecules of emotion yep. uh, the the neuro psycho neuro immunology how how our thoughts are literally communicating with our hormones yep our brain chemistry our microbiome yes with literally everything in our body and so when we let our minds run ragged and astray mm -hmm. and wild without learning how to regulate our own consciousness and thoughts it leads to this chronic level of stress and and even you know even the best of us who learn how to do that, um, you know it's still hard, and and you still it's need still to do hard. practices. So we we know we're very good at. Oh, I know I need to exercise because that's good for my body, and I know mm -hmm. I need to eat better. Uh, that's good for my body, but most people don't understand. They need to sort of reorient and recalibrate their relationship to stress because it's never going to go away. It's just how you perceive it. You know, Woody Allen. As a gun put in his head, he's going to be freaking out and having an erotic panic attack. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, James Bond has a gun in his head, he's like, oh, whatever, and he's going to like get out that. of it, right? Same gun, right. different person. And I think that's that's what we all have to yeah. learn. How do we respond to that stress mm -hmm. that we have? You know, how do we respond to it? Well said. So, so tell me about the <laughs> symptoms. If people are in a state of chronic stress, how, how would they know it's affecting their biology? Because there's... There's a whole list of symptoms that we talk about when we talk about adrenal fatigue or adrenal exhaustion. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, skepticism in the traditional community, medical community, about this whole idea of adrenal exhaustion. You either, you know, you have Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune disease that, you're, that nukes your adrenal glands, or you're fine. Right. But, but it's not really like that. So, right. So we have this whole, you know, really the what people are saying, the proper term for this this situation is HPA axis dysfunction, right? The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which are which are really parts of our endocrine system that handle and manage the stress response in our body. And when it gets out of balance, that that can really influence how we feel. And so we can have, and we'll get into this a little more, we can have HPA axis overactivity, right? Or, or underactivity. Mm. And so, you know, but, but those hormones, all of those different um, uh, parts of our endocrine system handle when we, you know, handle that stress response in our body. So um, when there is a, when there is a, a chronic stress over time, when a, a lot of cortisol gets produced from our adrenal glands. And at the beginning, as we talked about, that, that acute stress, that cortisol is really helpful for us because it helps increase our blood pressure. It helps us run away from the tiger. It helps us, it, it increases our blood sugar. Yeah. So we can get, uh, we can get nutrients and, and, and energy to our muscles so we can run away from that perceived threat, and which is really important if you were running away from a, a tiger or a dog or yeah. whatever, right? <laughs> So we want, we need to And it to be, stops your digestion because you, yeah. you want to be digesting your food while you're running from a tiger. And so, you know- um, It increases clotting, right? Absolutely. Because uh, you want to make sure if you get cut or bitten when you're running away that your blood clots very fast. Yeah. Right? And it's a phenomenal system and it's really good and really important. But over time, if we've got chronic stress for some reason, um, because we're we're because of our perception of the world around us, or we're not taking time to take care of ourselves, or we're eating a diet that's that's really stressful on the body, or we're not getting enough sleep, or um, or we have a chronic infection. I mean, we do see this with 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 illnesses too, like a chronic infection. Those chronic stressful events over time really can disrupt how all aspects of our, our hormone system works together, that whole HPA axis works, and it can get uh, dysregulated. And so that's that whole talk of that HPA axis dysregulation. So if your hypothalamus, which is in your brain, and your pituitary, yes. so it's all the command and control centers in your brain that then send messages to your adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys, and they produce 
adrenaline, yes. right? Cortisol, cortisol. Uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, but also DHEA, which is a, you know, is a hormone that gets turned into testosterone and estrogen and uh, hormones that impact our blood pressure and uh, electrolyte balance. So that it's involved in a lot of things. Um, and it's important to recognize that that all of uh, that the pituitary also impacts lots of other hormones in our body, our female hormones, our male hormones, and so our thyroid hormones. It's all it's all really connected, which is interesting as well. So when people are under a lot of chronic stress over time, the cortisol levels are um, are remaining higher than they should be for long periods of time, and so this is a whole feedback loop, right? This 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 system in our body is a whole feedback loop. So that high cortisol sort of shifts the way that the there's a feedback mechanism that occurs and, and in a way the body sort of s it slows everything down. Yeah. And so over time with high levels of, of cortisol uh, that are getting released all the time, people start to crash. They have like that, what they call burnout yeah. or, you know, their body sort of just slows down. We see their thyroid slow down. We see, we can see um, other hormones shift, but we definitely can over time, if we look, we can see a decrease in, in cortisol levels. So we can do some special tests that, that that look at that. It's so important what you're saying because you know the stress response is a good thing in the short run, but not in the long right. term. And we never really had these chronic stresses that we do now. We'd be in threat of danger. We'd mount the response. It was good. Right now, you're releasing high amounts of cortisol, and it's like a drug we give for people with autoimmune disease called prednisone. Yes. Or when you, for example, have a disease called Cushing's disease where you're adrenal glands or a pituitary tumor will produce a lot of cortisol that is not regulated by any feedback mechanisms. Yeah. And when that happens, you get all these problems, right? You get high blood pressure, you get mm -hmm. diabetes, your brain shrinks, the memory center in your brain shrinks yeah. so you can get dementia, you have muscle loss, yeah. right? You're you more have, likely to get sick more easily. More likely to get sick, your yep. immune system stops working as well. Yep. So you're, you're, you're really, accelerating all these age-related diseases mm -hmm. and you're also suffering from FLC syndrome, which is basically when you <laughs> feel like crap. So so let's let's drill down into some of the symptoms that people who might have this dysfunction get. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times people will, will you know, people with HPA axis dysfunction, they'll say, well, you know, I, I I have a good night's sleep, but I still feel tired in the morning. I can't get going. Or other people, depending on where they are in this whole process, they may feel like they're anxious all the time. They can't calm down. They're 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 uh, tired but wired, and they're just you know yeah, really. You get into bed anxious. and you lay there. You're tired, but you yeah. can't fall asleep. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they they can have a hard time dealing with the stress of everyday life. Um, they can feel more depressed or or irritable. Uh, things that they used to be able to do really easily are hard to do. So things mm -hmm. that they they you know their job maybe or. Um, uh, uh, handling going to the grocery store even. You know, things that, that used to be really easy to do every day become tasks for them. They feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. and exhausted. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they might get, as I said, sick more easily. Uh, they You can have more cravings for foods. You want it, you're looking Sugar. for things to pick you up, right? Yeah. So sugary foods, uh, salty foods, can you have cravings for them? You may feel more fatigued um, when you stand up. You get more tired. You might have low blood pressure um, over time and yeah. low blood sugar over time with with an underactive HPA axis. So yeah, and there's often this syndrome I see of tall, thin women, um, mm -hmm. which is really common, where they they get sort of adrenal burnout. They get low blood pressure, so dizzy when they stand up. Mm -hmm. They crave salt. They have anxiety. They have palpitations. They tend to get hypoglycemic, so their blood sugar actually is is not coming up when it should. And so you can kind of pretty much tell that this is going on with people. But what's interesting is, is it might be worth breaking down, is that adrenal burnout, let's just call it that, yep. comes in stages, right? Absolutely. So the, the first stage is, is, tell us about the first stage and how it progresses to full burnout. Absolutely. Because the so symptoms and the treatment are a little different for They each are one. a little different different. So at first when you're when you're when you've got that overactive adrenal gland, it's the beginning, let's say, of a, of just handling all this chronic stress. Um 
people feel that wired and tired. They're like anxious. They feel like they just can't calm down. They they feel um, upregulated inside. And um, and uh, and then over time, what can happen is with having that chronic levels of high cortisol. What can happen over time, as we talked about with that feedback loop, they they get this um, they get a decreased level of cortisol that occurs. So initially, see and high levels. Initially, when you we do see the high testing, and we'll talk. Let's we'll talk about the testing yeah, in yeah. a minute. Yeah, and then you see and then over time we see line. low. And when when it's flat line, what it feels like is burned out. Yeah, you know, you just feel exhausted. You can't get going in the morning. You're getting sick more frequently. You're um, that's when you see a lot of low blood pressure, low blood sugar, you know, salt cravings, but just, you know, literally you feel that burned out, you know, you're exhausted feeling. So one is like chronically high and there's like chronically low and there's kind of an in between where you get low in the morning and high at night. So you're exhausted yep. in the morning, but you can't fall asleep at night because you're Oh, More, yeah, it's like flipped. Your circadian rhythm is all screwed. So that's what we do differently than than what, you know, uh, conventional doctors often do. So By the way, this isn't even a diagnosis in conventional medicine. No, you know, really, like you were saying, if, if somebody has really uh, low cortisol or really high cortisol on blood testing, they'll call it, you know, it might be Cushing's or Addison's or a very serious adrenal yeah. issue. And and we were taught about that in medical school, but we weren't really taught about this this. Um, this these situations where if you did a blood level first thing in the morning, it probably would look okay. And you wouldn't really see a lot of, 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 of abnormalities in the blood testing. But if you look a little deeper and you do saliva testing and you check saliva four times in a day and you can check saliva when you uh, saliva for cortisol when you first wake up in the morning, they call that the cortisol awakening response. Um, what we should see, what we should see with that saliva testing is that when you first wake up in the morning, your cortisol increases. It's almost like a stress test for your for your adrenal glands. The um, the cortisol awakening response is like a stress test for your adrenal glands. Getting up in the morning is a little bit of a stress for the body, right? It needs to get going and 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 wake up. And so what we typically see is the cortisol increase first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. We want to see that. That means that the system's working well. And what we see is the cortisol levels in the beginning of the day are higher. And as the day goes on, they come down. So when you check somebody's saliva tests during the day, we should see it go up when they first wake up in the morning and then start to come down as the day goes on. And that's a very normal pattern. And what we were talking about is over time, if people have a, a lot of stress and anxiety going on, you might see high levels of cortisol. And then over time, you might see that it start to flip where they're low in the morning, but too high at night. And then if things really go on for a while, you might see a, a low level of cortisol throughout the whole day. And it really gives us a lot of information about how best to treat somebody and how best to take care of them and what, what they need to really focus on. And this is something you wouldn't get at a traditional doctor's office. They're not going to no. look at your uh, salivate cortisol levels. They'll say, oh, well, you have Cushing's and there's tests for that or Addison's and there's tests for that. But short of these two extremes, and that's what's so different about functional medicine. It's really about this continuum of dysfunction. It's not just on or off. It's not like you have diabetes or you don't. Yeah. Right? And like you have high blood pressure or you don't. It's a gradual worsening over time. And 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 those diseases are very particular because they're either a tumor, which is Cushing's, or they're an autoimmune disease, which is usually caused by gluten, <laughs> the Addison's disease, which is what President Kennedy had, actually. Yes. Um, and, and it certainly, I'm sure, affected him. So when you have these patients come in, you do this history, you find these symptoms, you sort of hear, hear their story, uh, how do you start to approach correcting this? Because you know, because I found you know some things are really easy in functional medicine. Someone has you know bacterial overgrowth, or they have gut issues, irritable valve, one, two, three, it's fixed. This takes a little bit of time because of the amount of, stress we've put on our adrenals, we have to constantly try to build them back up over yes. time. And it takes a little bit of time to recover. Yeah. I mean, I think what's a f fascinating is, you know, and what we realize is the body has this tremendous ability to heal, right? And we, this is an area where our body can heal. We see it heal all the time. It just sometimes takes a little TLC and some care. And that's where that's where the lifestyle factors really, really make a huge impact. You know, we work with people to to really balance their their diet and focus on nutrition. And, and we can delve into each of these more, you know, getting good sleep, resting. Resting is important, right? We need to give our body time to rest. And, you know, we're living in a world where it's hard sometimes to turn mm -hmm. it off and people aren't. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so they're really 
uh, having issues because of it. So we have to help them rest and recuperate and get in their regular meditation and, and breath work and, and take time for themselves and turn off the lights at night and, you know, turn off the computer and the cell phone. And, you know, diet makes a huge difference. There's so much we can do. Wait, wait, before you get into diet, yeah. let's go back to what you just said, because the light thing, the computers, the screen, it's not just that they're distracting. The, the, there's a biology around your adrenals that has to do with something called your circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. And it requires certain types of stimuli at certain times of the day and and different kinds of stimuli at the other times of the day. So in the morning, the way to get going with your circadian rhythm and your adrenal glands to properly function is to have sunlight for Absolutely. 20 minutes in the morning, which how many of us actually do that yeah. and get outside? And, and the same thing at night, if you are stimulating your eyes with bright light that isn't mm -hmm. have all, all the blue filtered out, which is you can see blue black glasses or just getting off screens, you will actually stimulate more awakefulness and you will suppress cortisol because like, I mean, suppress melatonin. Yes. Right. Because in the morning you wake up and you, you see the sunlight, well, your melatonin levels go down so you don't feel sleepy all day. Yep. But, but if you're having light at night, it actually keeps the melatonin down so you mm -hmm. can't fall asleep. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter and I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger, longer. Now back to this week's episode. Yeah, I mean, so circadian rhythm is is critical, and um, we're gonna we're gonna touch on it with one of the cases I have because because uh, you know we'll get into it in a minute. But she was working more in the evening shift, and and I think it, it it really is hard for a lot of people with depending on the shifts that they have to work. But you mentioned that you know getting up in the morning, getting outside, getting that sunshine uh, helps for so many reasons. It helps our mood, it helps us fall asleep more at night, and it helps us. You know, our body likes to have regularity and rhythm. And I think that's one thing we really work on with people when they're really struggling with this is is getting them in some pattern and rhythm of mm -hmm. of you know getting a good sleep cycle, get getting a good eating cycle you know, not not grabbing and going, you know, not skipping meals. Um, I mean, there's a lot to be said for fasting. You know, you've done a lot of uh, podcasts on this and there can be really a lot of great things with fasting. But sometimes when people are really, they're, when their um, HPA axis is really underactive and it's not working very well and if they've got the signs of burnout or adrenal dysfunction, right? We, um, uh, fasting sometimes for too long can be more stress on their body. Yeah. Or some extreme diets can be more stress Stressful. on their body. And they might not be at a point where they can do it, they can they can feel good with it, right? It, they can't get all the benefit from it. So they can still fast for 12 hours, but we might not be fasting them for 16 hours or 18 hours during that time. Well, it's really important what you bring up about food because there are certain foods that actually cause stress in the body, independent oh, yes. of your thoughts. And there are certain foods that reduce stress in the body, independent mm -hmm. of what you're thinking, right? Yes. So it, it, it's actually food can be a stressor or a relaxer, depending on what you're eating. Can you talk about the foods that tend to cause more cortisol, adrenaline, and stress in the body? And right. then some of the foods that we would be thinking about that might help reduce that. That's such a great point. You know, you know, if we if we eat um, um, uh, a donut and with coffee and sugar. I'm going to an extreme here for breakfast. That's right? not that extreme. It's probably the <laughs> breakfast of most Americans. Dunkin' that Donuts is or really coffee. stressful on the body, mm. right? Why? Or because it causes this spike in our blood sugar because it gets digested and absorbed really quickly. Our blood blood sugar goes up quickly, and the body goes, "Oh no!" Right? That's a it, it, it gets stressful 
for the body, the body produces a bunch of insulin to help lower it. And, and then what happens is the blood sugar drops afterwards. And so those ups and downs in blood sugar like that are really stressful for the body. And, and in, when the if your blood, blood sugar is dropping, it's a life threatening emergency. You got to go get food. <laughs> right. Right. So those, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, eating a lot of uh, foods that cause your blood sugar to go up and then drop with, you know, those, those easily to digest and absorb, you know, you have a can of, a can of soda. I mean, we're, you know, those things really are stressful for the body. They create this stress. They create the cortisol response. It's one of the reasons we get a lot of weight gain around the belly when we eat those kind of foods, because they are stressful for the body. And so instead we want to be really balancing our blood sugar. And okay, before, before you get to how to fix it, I, I just want to point out this study that was just so mind blowing when I read it years ago by a friend of ours, Dr. David Ludwig from Harvard. And he took, he took kids that were overweight and fed them three different breakfasts, right? Yep. Oatmeal, steel cutouts, and an omelet. Same calories, okay? Same calories, but different carbohydrate, protein, different fat. What he found was that the kids who had the regular oatmeal, like the quickly absorbed oatmeal, we think oatmeal is healthy, right? It's not like they're having a donut. Right. Their insulin went up, obviously their blood sugar went up, but their cortisol went up, their adrenaline went up. Yep. So the body perceived it as a stress. Yes. Whereas the kids who ate the omelet didn't happen. Yes. And then the kids who ate the oatmeal were hungrier, wanted more food. So we know that, that starch and sugar create a biological stress response in the body. And that's bad. In addition to the fact that the sugar causes a problem, your brain chemistry and your neurotransmitters are talking to your fat cells. And they're telling them when they're under stress to store more fat. So literally stress makes you gain weight independent of what you're eating. So it's really, it's fascinating when you look at weight and other issues, it's so connected. It's so connected. It's it's fascinating. So I mean, so really balancing blood sugar is is so powerful. It's, you know, I mean, people sometimes we say these things again and again, like, you know, balance your blood sugar, have a good source of protein, healthy fat and fiber at each meal. And sometimes we say it so much that I wonder people just, oh Don't yeah, it it's the same thing. They're just saying eat healthy. <laughs> but it's really critical to have a good source of protein, healthy fat, and great source of fiber at every meal because it's it's it it is not allowing for that stress response to happen in the body. It's it's nourishing the body, and that's exactly what the body needs. Hmm. So yeah, and so I think you know using food and having the right quality fats, low glycemic diet, lots of fiber, phytochemicals. These are all messenger molecules that help reduce the stress in the body. Yes. So, um, you know, so we always start with food first, and this is a great place to start in this area, you know, really working to balance the blood sugar, preventing those spikes in blood sugar, preventing that stress. Yeah. We often work to pull people off of caffeine for a period of time. Mm. You know, um, it, it, if they're in that state where they're really anxious, yeah, they don't need the caffeine. If they're in that state where they're burnt out and exhausted, they might feel like they need the caffeine, but that's actually you know, a little bit of a stress for their body. And so when the adrenal glands or the whole HPA axis isn't able to handle that stress at this point in time, you don't want to add to it. So we often will pull people away from caffeine or really lower their levels or keep it to a little bit of green tea and, and just not excessive amounts. How about alcohol? Is that going to relax you? Or is it going <laughs> to cause a problem? <laughs> You know, I mean, so, you know, it's it's really with alcohol, it's all about moderation, right? It's really all about moderation. We know that too much alcohol is going to wake us up in the middle of the night. Um, we know that when it wears off, it's, it's you know, alcohol is a depressant. When it wears off, it we get that rebound stimulating effect. Many We really need to be working on sleep during this period mm -hmm. of time, well, all the time. But we, we need to get good restful sleep. So we just have to watch the amount. I mean, that's really, really important. And yeah. so for some, some of our patients, we take them off of most of the alcohol for a period of time. And, you know, it also wears down your B vitamins. And B vitamins are really important for- So the, when you drink, you deplete your B vitamins. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And B vitamins are critical for the functioning of our adrenal glands. So so things that you might have been, you know, people will say to me, well, I, I've always had two cups of coffee in the morning and it's been fine. You know, why can't I have two cups of coffee now in the morning? And and, and, you know, when you get to that exhausted, burnt out stage, um, that that's just too much for your body at this period of time. You know, we just have to be a little more gentle. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I also think what you said before, I want to come back to, because it's, it's such an important point. We jump right over it. You said something that 
uh, I think is worth underscoring, which is that infections or any physical illness can cause a stress response. Yes. So let's say you have Lyme disease or you have a virus or whatever. Independent of well, your thoughts or feelings or perceptions, it can cause a stress. And there are certain foods that drive inflammation that cause a physiologic stress response. So anything in the body that causes inflammation, either your thoughts, which can cause inflammation, yeah. or gluten or dairy or food sensitivities or sugar, all these can cause a stress response. So sometimes getting rid of not just the junk food, obviously, and the sugar, but actually potential food sensitivities or gluten, dairy can be enormously effective. You know, and I and with the with the point about the infections, I think that's something that we see a lot of people who've become de debilitated over time from dealing with whether it was Lyme or Epstein Barr virus or you know some other chronic infection, and and they're just really having a hard time rebounding from it. And it's important for us to support the adrenal glands during that time because because that's a really important part of healing because over time you know they they you know if we were to do their uh, saliva test we often see it being very on the lower side and that and that's an area that we have to support it, we're supporting their immune system we're supporting their digestive system we're supporting their detoxification system but we also have to support them hormonally too it is important for us to pay attention to all right so what are the other things we have to do so we diet we clean up our diet we cut down the alcohol the sugar there's certain uh, other lifestyle things that are really important you mentioned sleep and and that's a whole other thing because if you're stressed it's hard to get the sleep regulated and we know how to do that um, but there's some other things that are really important uh what what are the favorite techniques or tools for for discharging stress because my view is that we can't eliminate stress from our lives. Right. It's coming at us, whether yep. we like it or not. But can we do a Tai Chi move on it and actually not have it really overtake us? And how do we discharge that stress? Tai Chi is a great way to do it, actually. All right, Tai Chi, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Right, mindfulness activities, right? Meditation and yoga and, and, and just um, throughout all of those practices, we get to recognize how crazy our mind is and how much it can be, you know. You call me crazy? <laughs> <laughs> thinking the wrong Probably things right. that are making us really um, exhausted and wiped out. And so, you know, that's where the power of mindfulness and meditation is, is because it helps us really stop and, and identify these things that are, are taking us down the wrong path. Absolutely. So the simple, like I, 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 you know, I have so much stress in my life over the years and I've really learned techniques that I can use to change my physiological state mm -hmm. right so i use like yoga nidra so i put on like the headphones and lay down nidra. and have a guided relaxation for 20 minutes i'll do mm -hmm. meditation yep. twice a day i'll i'll do yoga mm -hmm. i'll take a steam or a sauna and an ice bath that literally changes your all your hormones and adrenaline I will get a massage sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I um, love that. And exercise. Body it, work. I love body work. It works very well for me. You know, yeah. acupuncture, hands-on body work, uh, you know, neuromuscular therapy. Yeah. Getting out in nature. Yeah. Yeah, nature, right. And yeah. so all these things, taking a walk. And, and, and exercise particularly is important. Because um, mm -hmm. when I think about exercise, I'm like, what? well, we never really exercise when you're hunter-gatherers. We'd like... Right. We like run from a tiger, you know, yep. and, and we do normal physical work. But when you when you look at um, this this book uh, written by Robert Sapolsky, it's called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, mm -hmm. which is this whole research that he's done. He's a neurobiologist from Stanford. He's a crazy guy. But anyway, he's, he studied, you know, the stress response in his book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He talks about the fact that they literally will like uh, run like crazy to from the tiger or the lion or whatever yep. and then one of them gets killed and they all just go back to eating the grass right and and, and they have this a massive discharge of the stress response through exercise and then they just can go relax while their whatever cousin is getting eaten and it doesn't bother them anymore so but we just have this chronic state of stress and we don't discharge it yeah so i know for me exercise i can be really stressed and i can go for a run or i can go bike ride or 
and I come back and I just feel like it's I've, I've literally burned off all the adrenaline. Yeah, and and you know I think I think other aspect other things that are really great for for this from a lifestyle perspective are, are journaling. You know, writing mm. down your thoughts and your concerns and your worries. Um, the gratitude journal, really shifting our thought process. You know, sometimes we can shift our thought process on our own. Sometimes we need a little support to do that, whether it's a you know a health coach or a counselor or. Um, you know, because we've got to work to change some of how we're, we're viewing the world around us yeah. is really important. That is true. I think that's a very important point, Liz, because many of us have a habit of listening to our lower selves mm -hmm. and not our higher selves. And you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and so sometimes you just got to like shut that lower self voice up and listen to that higher self that knows better. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of us struggle with that. I, me included. I, mean, I think it's, uh, it, it, you have to learn to not let your mind run your life. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, it's not always very friendly. <laughs> There's a lot of negative self-talk and a lot of fear and understanding that. And, and meditation can be really helpful with that. Journaling can be helpful. There's yeah. various kinds of approaches, life coaching. Let's talk about, uh, we talked about exercise. We talked about diet. We talked about sleep. We talked about stress reduction. We talked about getting out in nature. Um, let's talk about the role of nutritional supplements because we use that a lot in helping yeah. people to recover, and partly because during during times of stress, you really get depleted yes. in nutrition and nutritional supplements. And I, I remember reading this paper years ago about Kosovo, which mm -hmm. was a war zone back in the '90s, and. What they found was that the people who were in this chronic state of stress in this war zone had tremendously depleted magnesium. They literally collected their urine and they found the magnesium just pouring out of them, which is the relaxation mineral. Yeah, right? magnesium's wonderful. And when we're low in magnesium, you know, we also feel more depressed. There's been interesting research on that too. So it becomes this vicious cycle. And so um, magnesium, we get a lot from our foods, our whole foods. But sometimes when there's been a lot of, when you've been going through this chronic stress period of time, sometimes we need to really give people extra magnesium. And, um, and, and so we use that a lot as a supplement. Um, we use B vitamins, good quality, methylated, B complex, um, helps support uh, the, the body during this time. Um, we use a good multivitamin and just Zinc some of the basics. Really yep. And um, sometimes we'll use things like adaptogens, uh, ashwagandha. So what are adaptogens? Adaptogens are herbal substances that really help the adrenal glands to so support them herbally. So, and they can they call them adaptogens because they help us if if we're overstressed they can help us feel more calm but if we're if we're if we're depleted they can help support us so they can adapt to what we need mm. in a sense i guess i mean they, I think they, they've been used even in, in you know in uh, space exploration the russians mm -hmm. cosmonauts always took these adaptogens uh mm -hmm. to help their stress resilience and yeah. i personally take them because i you know i live a fairly high stress life and i i want to create as much resilience so what are the what are the top ones that we use? Uh, ashwagandha, rhodiola, um, uh, Asian ginseng, you know, Siberian ginseng. Even. Yes, yeah. So those are really um, supportive to the adrenal glands, and uh, there, you know, there are. We sometimes will use sup, um, things like licorice if somebody's really depleted in their adrenal glands. Um, but you have to be a little careful if you're doing that mm -hmm. on your own. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, uh, if your adrenal glands aren't really low, sometimes that makes you feel more anxious. So, yeah. so that one you have to be a little bit more careful I mean, with. If you have low blood pressure, if yes. you're dizzy when you stand up, yep. um, if you have palpitations, you know, yep. then you probably will benefit from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it can definitely raise up the blood pressure. Yeah. So if blood pressure, if you run a little high with blood pressure, you need to be careful with with regular licorice. So, so why don't we go into a few cases that you've had? Because I think it's really instructive to learn about how how this affects real people. Yeah. The first one was a nurse, an ER nurse. Yeah. So she was a 39 year old woman, and she came to see me because she had fatigue, and um, and she she was frustrated because this was this was new to her she had never really had a lot of fatigue in her life she was a she was a go go person she was a, a nurse and you know lots of energy worked in the er really loved her job and um you know 
um, really got a lot of, of personal reward from her job. And so was really, really frustrated and concerned where she was feeling so tired. She didn't want to go to do her job anymore. And she would, it would overwhelm her now. And she, she, um, couldn't really respond to some of the stresses at work as, as easily. And, it, and she was feeling, uh, sad about that, you know, and concerned about that. And so she had seen her primary doctor who had said, well, maybe this is depression and should mm. we start some medication? And she wasn't ready to do that. And she wanted to look at things a little bit of a different way. So she came to see us. And when we, you know, when we delved deeper, we found out that, you know, she was, she worked the evening shift. So she would work in the evenings. Uh, she would, uh, um, she was kind of not always that careful with her diet. You know, she'd grab a couple cups of coffee. She'd grab some food here or there. She would eat in the cafeteria at work. So, it, you know, she tried to be healthy, but it wasn't the, the you know. I mean, when I worked overnight shifts in the year, I would have like a quadruple espresso, a giant chocolate chip cookie, and a half a pound of ice cream, and I'd head to the ER for my 11 at night to 7 in the morning shift. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and so and so she'd gained some pounds. She'd gained like 20 pounds over the last couple of years. And so she was frustrated with that too. And she was so tired, she just couldn't exercise anymore. She didn't she didn't have the energy to get up in the morning and to exercise before she went on her shift. And then when she came home from work, she was feeling she was more um you know, she had a hard time calming down after the shift mm. and getting a good night's sleep. And so she was having a hard time getting to sleep at night. She was feeling that, you know, that uh, wired feeling at night when she needed to go to sleep. So we did her saliva test. We did the cortisol awakening response with saliva test. And what we saw is that the morning that cortisol awakening was low, she wasn't able to mount that cortisol response in the morning. She was burnt out. She was burnt out. Exactly, she was burnt out, and um, and and it was a little bit high in the evening. So you know, I mean, you know, we talked a lot about you know, just it just build you know it can build up with people. You know, they kind of have been just living their regular life and and making it through and feeling fine, and then it sort of just adds up over time, especially having a stressful job like that and not not being able to or not taking the time to take care of herself every day and calm down. So um, we really focused, we focused a lot on her lifestyle. We worked to, to, she ended up shifting and starting to work more during the days. She was able to do that because she had been there long enough. So she was able to shift her, her time. Um, she started uh, 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 getting up in the morning and, and doing some calming exercises, some meditation first thing in the morning. She um, started to pack her own food and bring her own food to to work. And we we worked to clean up her diet, take away some of the caffeine for a period of time, really worked to balance her blood sugar, you know, make sure she was getting that 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 protein, healthy fat and fiber at every meal, you know, really some of the basics there. Um, you know, we 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 also gave her a little bit of the um an, an herbal support that had some licorice and uh, ashwagandha first thing in the morning, just to help give her the energy for the day and a good B complex, and um, and and really focused on her getting you know getting outside uh, you know and getting some sunshine in the morning and getting her exercise in. And we started we started sort of gentle with her exercise because she hadn't been doing very much and she was tired. But over time, she was able to kick up the intensity yeah. and start to do more intense exercise. I think that's an important point you bring up because a lot of people have adrenal exhaustion. They don't tolerate intense exercise. They just can't. Because right. when you're exercising, it's like you're, you've got to mount the stress response. It's very difficult for them. And I had a terrible flashback when you were talking about her because I, I worked in Idaho in this small town and worked as a family doctor, probably 80 hours a week, delivering babies on top of my regular schedule, off and up all night, ran the ER as well. You know, we had to rotate through a night or two a week. So we were like on these 24 hour shifts and I had babies on top of that. And after like almost four years, I decided to stop working there and I took like a few months off and I was ready to go visit my friend and drive in my car with my family to go from like Idaho to California. And I literally, when I finished Rick, I literally could not pick myself up off the floor. Yeah. I was so exhausted yes. in such a deep and profound way. It took me like three months to recover. Yep. Uh, and I, you know, I didn't have chronic fatigue or anything back then, but I was just so burnt out. And yeah. I thought, oh, you know, I'm a doctor and that stands for medical deity and sleep is an option. And I would just literally go for days with 
very little sleep. I mean, I was the, I was the same way. I, I feel like I've learned the most about this whole HPA axis on myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I've been burnt out a bunch of times. Um, yeah. And and the, the biggest one was after I went through all my cancer treatment and I had my two kids, I, you know, I finished all the treatment and then I had my two kids and, um, and, and, and it was kind of like at the end of that whole process where I had gone through all the treatment when I was 30 and then actually had two children, which is exhausting for the body. And then I was the same way. I was, I was just burnt out. And, you know, you know, there's nobody, especially when people go to the doctor, there's often not a lot that's, that's, that can, or that, that, that happens conventionally. Um, you know, we're just not training our physicians sometimes, I think, to recognize that. And so no. we often go to the depression place first, right? Or right. the medication place right. first, where where it's just we really need to have that time of self-care and, and shifting, shifting our mind so process true. and everything. So so the first case was sort of like a in a way a physiological problem. It was her schedule, it was her rhythm of her life, and it yes. was some of her bad habits. Um but the next case is a woman who really suffered from psychological trauma. Yeah. And and we know that, that adverse childhood experiences we call ACEs are highly linked to this chronic stress or PTSD, which is an extreme version of it. And, and that, you know, sometimes it's very difficult for people to get out of that state of of alarm or hypervigilance that comes from being in an unsafe or unstable environment they grew up in, whether it's an alcoholic or abusive parent or financial insecurity or worse, you know, people grew up in war zones. And, yeah. uh, and, and so we don't really do a good job with helping people with that in medicine. So tell us about this, this young woman who, who really suffered in this way and how you helped her to reset not only her biology, but her, her mind. Yeah, I mean, so she was 28 when she came to see me, and the reason she came in was her digestion. I mean, she was frustrated with her her irritable bowel, right? So she was she was had a lot of digestive issues, bloating, cramping, diarrhea, and she was anxious. Um, and as we as we delved into things, I mean, we did of course clean up her diet and and um, and you know help her with some digestive issues. But really, as we delved into things, we realized and we learned that this was more her hormone balance in her body and mm -hmm. that HPA axis. Mm -hmm. She had um, she had an abusive, um, uh, her father was an alcoholic and her mom, just living with her father being an alcoholic, right? Her, her husband being an alcoholic, you know, had a lot of stress in her life. And so she almost, she often overreacted with her kids which we see, right? And she was, you know, just not to blame, not to blame her, but she often overreacted. And we know that um, that impacts, we know that how the mom reacts impacts the kids and their the offspring, even when they're a fetus, but definitely when they're young too. And when they're, um, uh, when the mom overreacts, then the, the kids learn to overreact in that same way. And so, um, and of course the, uh, the stress and trauma with her dad and, you know, she was very successful. She had a good job and, um, but sort of she had, she was just feeling anxious all the time, feeling anxious all the time. And, and that anxiety was kind of going into her, um, her diet, you know, this diarrhea that she had, this urgency that she had. And, um, uh, she would, she tried to, she knew she was anxious and she knew she needed to calm down her body. But when she did some breath work or meditation, she couldn't shut down her mind. Yeah. And so it just wasn't, she would say, I just can't do it. We get that all the time with our patients, right? They say, oh, I just can't, I can't, I can't shut down my mind. Meditation doesn't work for me. So, um, so, you know, that was she, when she came in, uh, we did that, the, uh, saliva test. test. Yeah. yeah. And what we saw is her levels were high. So she was still in that just high cortisol through the day. So her body was, you know, just continually pumping out a lot of excess cortisol. And, um, um, and that was making her feel really anxious and unsettled inside and contributing to, uh, her overall health. So then we got more information. She was, you know, having, she was also a two to three cup coffee in the morning. She often skipped breakfast. She skipped her lunch many times or just grabbed whatever she could. And, um, and, and so we really, we really worked in, in many aspects with her 
Um, we have a woman, Suda, who works in our clinic and works with people to teach them mindfulness, different ex exercises and meditation. And I think that can be really helpful. You know, there's a lot of great apps out there. Um, but sometimes people need a little more handholding than that. And so, um, you know, I, I had her work with, uh, with, with Suda, who works in our clinic, and, and that was very helpful. She worked with her for a long period of time, but just to do some regular uh, uh, weekly uh, meditation sessions together, you know, and some sometimes people, you need a little help from somebody yeah, else. Yeah, like you know, energy and, work, breath work. Yeah, I put her, I had her work with a, some, a Reiki specialist as well, because many times some of those ACEs, those, um, adverse childhood experiences get stuck, that trauma gets stuck in our body. And energy work like Reiki um, really can be be helpful at releasing some of that struck, mm. struck oh my goodness, stuck trauma, which yeah. um, which is important sometimes to, yeah. we have to get let go of. Well, it's interesting right now, there's a, a lot of research going on um, around psychedelics mm -hmm. uh, and stress and trauma. And in fact, uh, just a couple of days ago, published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, Psychiatry, I think there was a, a study on psilocybin, which is mm -hmm. mushrooms, they call magic mushrooms, uh, that was four times as effective as antidepressants. Yeah. Uh, and it's used for PTSD, for war veterans, for yeah. uh, people who have cancer, and, and, and it's not legal yet. There are a lot of research trials going on, so sometimes people can get enrolled. I think Oregon just legalized it for therapy, which is amazing. Huh, uh, there are states which have decriminalized it as well. So it's really, I think, going to be an emerging therapy that often works really well to help break down that sense of um, fear and separateness that makes us stay in this chronic state of trauma. So, you know, we're learning a lot about how to deal with trauma and there's so many different techniques. And I think yeah. what you underscored was that, you know, often the doorway into healing from chronic stress is through your body, not just your mind, through your diet, exercise, circadian yeah. rhythms, the right supplements, various kinds of stress reduction techniques, meditation, yoga, Reiki, whatever, maybe even some of these newer therapies that are being used out there like uh, psychedelic assisted therapy. And I think that we, we, you know, we're sort of on the verge of, I think, a real breakthrough in understanding how to help people with this because it, it is so rampant. And I think now given the phase of the world and COVID and the economy and politics and yada, 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 it's like enough already. And I think, you know, I think all of us feel it. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's really important for us to learn how to manage our stress response. And I often say, you know, we think the opposite of stress is relaxation. Mm -hmm. But I, I think for most people, relaxation is like, I'm going to sit and have a beer and watch football or watch my sitcom. That's not relaxation. I, we're talking about an active process of relaxation. Yeah. So it's actually active, right? And it can be meditation or yoga or other things. And I think these are really things that people can access that are available to us that are mostly free. Yep. Um, and for people who are really struggling, there are sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes a need for more advanced therapies. And yep. in functional medicine, we do the cortisol testing. We do all these other therapies. We, we can address the underlying physiological causes of stress, whether heavy metals or an infection or allergies. And also, I think we, we um, understand that sometimes people need some adrenal support. And, and for very few patients over my career, I've used very, very low dose hydrocortisone, mm -hmm. which is a treatment that's not normally used in traditional medicine, but can really help rescue people from this complete state of, of crash until we sort of build them up. So I, th I think there's just a lot of options for people and I encourage people to check it out. Come to the Ultra Wellness Center. We're seeing patients virtually now. Go to ultrawellnesscenter.com. Liz, you've been doing this forever and, uh, and so have I. And I think, you know, it's really gratifying to see these patients once you give them the, the guardrails and teach them how their bodies work, that they can learn how to do this. And for me, if I didn't, if I didn't have these tools, I'd be a mess right yeah. now because, you know, I've had so much stress in my life and I've learned how to actually discharge the stress. So. I can actually function and have a good life. So thank you so much, Dr. Bo and Liz, for being on the Doctor's Pharmacy Podcast on this special episode, House Call. It's been great to have you again. And if you love this podcast, please share with your family and friends. Leave a comment. If you've found ways to deal with chronic stress, please share them with us. We'd love to hear. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on the Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>